When taking my jazz studies degree, there was an improvisation class that we had to take each year in which we learned how to improvise an effective solo. In this class, each student was required to do a fair bit of transcribing and analyzing solos from historic jazz musicians as a way to learn from the greats. I always found this process extremely fun and enlightening. Musical improvisation allows you to express yourself personally in a way that you just can't in pre-composed music, and the process of taking a solo and trying to reverse engineer what the soloist was thinking as they played it gave a look into the mind and personality of that musician that you just couldn't get any other way. So today I want to analyze the sax solo from Mario Kart 8's Dolphin Shoals the same way we used to in my old improv class. The soloist we'll be analyzing is an alto sax player named Kazuki Katsuta. I want to point out three things that I think are worthy of study. The solo's interest curve, the soloist's strategies for building interesting lines, and his musical vocabulary. First, the interest curve. Contrary to what most young musicians may think, a solo's primary function is to serve the song that's being soloed over. So first, let's take a look at the song's form and chord progression. In jazz, solos are played over the exact same form and chord progression as the melody to the tune. Okay, okay, not all jazz, but most jazz. Dolphin Shoals has a very simple form with a very simple chord progression. It's an A-B form with a 16-bar A section and an 8-bar B section. The interest curve for the tune is perfect. We start off the A section with this diatonic walk up the E flat major scale, playing one chord per bar. Our five chord reliably resolves back to our one chord and things are pretty chill. After establishing a pattern by repeating the 1, 2, 3, 5 progression, we start to crank up the intensity. This 2, 5 progression subverts your expectations by jumping up to a 2, 5 in E major instead of resolving nicely to our tonic of E flat. What follows is another 2-5 progression, only this time an added 3 chord in the middle speeds up the harmonic rhythm to 2 chords per bar, which is a great way to raise intensity. This 5 chord still keeps us from the resolution we want, instead repeating the same 2-3-5 move before finally releasing back to our tonic just as we move into the B section. The B section diffuses all the tension that was built up over the last 8 bars as it consists entirely of a 1-4 progression over a tonic bass pedal, with a slowed harmonic rhythm of 1 chord every 2 bars. If you chart out the interest curve of this form and progression, we get a slow build-up throughout the A section that rises pretty steadily with a slight bump where our brief excursion to E major comes in, leading up to our climax right at the end of the A section. The B section then winds the tension back down to where it started, acting as a conclusion if this were a more formally narrative work of art. What's cool about this is that the solo matches this interest curve almost perfectly. It hits the ground running with a flurry of 16th notes that flows through the first four bars, but then slows down to more simple 8th note lines throughout the second four bars. Then we get blasted with 16th note chromatic lines that swing wildly up and down the range of the saxophone before blasting off into outer space right at the climax of the tune. The B section then consists of Katsuta winding down his solo, bringing it back down to earth and resolving cleanly on our tonic. It's a little smooth jazz maybe, but I think it's a brilliant solo. Aligning the structure of your solo with the structure of the tune you're playing adds power to your solo and allows you to draw out the dramatic potential that the tune lays out for you. So the overarching structure of the solo is great. Now let's dive into the nitty gritty. 
Even with a great structure, if the lines that you're playing as a soloist don't sound good on their own, your solo's gonna sound kinda boring. The ways that Katsuta builds interesting lines are by using chromatic approach tones, chromatic enclosures, and by implying chord extensions and alterations. We can see two types of chromatic approach tones in the very first bar of the solo. The first note he plays is a dissonant F sharp that quickly resolves up to the third, G. Immediately following this, a jump up to the fifth, B flat, is followed by a chromatic walk down to the fourth, A flat. This sort of chromatic motion is extremely common in jazz soloing due to something known as the bebop scale. A mixolydian scale with an added chromatic passing note between the flat 7th and the root, used by jazz improvisers from the 40s and onward to allow soloists to play longer, continuous 8th note lines while still keeping all the strong chord tones of a chord on the strong beats of a measure. It's extremely common for jazz soloists to use the bebop scale based off of the 5 chord of whatever key they're in, even when they're not playing over that particular 5 chord. These chromatic embellishments serve two purposes, to add some colorful dissonance to the solo and to make sure you're emphasizing the chord tones you want to emphasize. You can find a great example of a chromatic enclosure in the ninth bar of the solo. An enclosure is when a targeted note is preceded by the notes above and below it. Over this F minor chord, the third A flat is targeted. An enclosure starts on the B flat, overshoots the target and goes down to the G, and then finally resolves up to the targeted note. We see this happen in beats 3 and 4 of this bar. A chromatic enclosure is the same idea, but instead of these notes being diatonic to the key, they both are played one semitone away from the targeted note on either side. Oftentimes you'll see players take half of each type of enclosure, doing a diatonic above, chromatic below kind of approach. Earlier in the same bar we see an extended chromatic enclosure. This B natural sets up a resolution to the 5th of our F minor chord, C, but we first overshoot it up to the D. This is pretty typical enclosure stuff. After this though, instead of resolving right away, we slide down a semitone to the D flat, which starts off another chromatic enclosure that dives down to the B before finally resolving up to our target note C. This way of building lines can give you a lot of bang for your buck, so to speak. Instead of one note, C, we end up with a five note line that has its own wave of tension and resolution. We also see Katsuta implying alternate harmony over certain chords, which is extremely common in the jazz improvisational world as well. Just one bar after our super enclosure, we see the return of our bebop scale motif, only this time it's preceded by the flat nine of the underlying B flat seven chord. Actually, taking this whole bar into account, Katsuta basically outlines a B-flat-13 sus-flat-9 chord, which is much more colorful than the regular old 7 sus chord that we hear in the accompaniment. Adding these sorts of altered extensions in a solo is especially common over dominant chords, as the dominant chord's whole job in functional harmony is to create tension so that you can release it. So adding more tension on top of dominant chords only enhances the degree to which they perform their intended function. Another example of stepping outside of the written harmony is at the climax of the solo, where Katsuta wails on this high G flat over the B flat sus and E flat major chords. It's actually not quite a G flat, it's kinda halfway between a G flat and a G natural. This kind of third that's halfway between a major third and a minor third is called a blue note, after its extensive use in the blues genre. Finally, let's move on to the vocabulary we see in Katsuta's solo. This is where you start to really see a soloist's personality come through. Remember how I mentioned that chromatic approach to the third followed by a leap up in the first bar of the solo? This phrase appears three times throughout the solo. In the first bar, the fourth bar jumping up to a D, and then in the 11th bar during our move into E major, approaching the third of the E major before jumping up to an E natural. This is an example of a piece of musical vocabulary that Katsuta has ingrained in his playing. Much like a language, improvisation requires a wide vocabulary of musical phrases and a deep understanding of how these phrases interact with each other to properly express oneself. 
Because improvising at a fast tempo like this requires tons of precise decision making every second, soloists need to be able to string together musical ideas without putting thought into each individual note, usually by grouping them into phrases or licks. It's like how we don't think about every letter in every word we say, or even every word in every sentence we say. Great soloists think about their music in exactly the same kind of general sense. Take the extended chromatic enclosure I discussed earlier. This exact phrase, note for note, appears five bars later to approach the fourth over a B-flat-7 sus chord. Clearly, Kotzta has practiced the hell out of this phrase and can plug it into a solo whenever context dictates that it would be appropriate. One of my favorite bits of vocabulary is simple but effective, and gives a glimpse into the thought process behind building the solo as a whole. A common idea in jazz solos is to avoid resolving to the tonic, because this pretty much kills all the momentum of your solo. It sounds too resolved to be part of a continuing line, and can easily come off as a little cheesy. Throughout Dolphin Shoals, Katsuta plays lines that resolve to the tonic, but in each instance he always quickly jumps down to the sixth, C. This prevents the cheesy, over-resolved feeling I mentioned, and extends the line a little bit, too. Listen and see what I mean. He even does it in the two E major bars here, this time escaping down to C sharp, the sixth of our temporary key. Now at the very end of the solo he plays one last line that leaps up to the fifth before walking down to the tonic, and this time he resolves to the tonic cleanly and stays there, no dropping down to the C immediately after. This shows that Katsuta was thinking carefully about how each of his lines resolved, making sure not to kill the momentum of the solo before it had reached its climax. But what time could be more appropriate for a big solid resolution than the very end of your solo? It does sound a little cheesy, admittedly, but it still goes to show part of the thought process behind Katsuta's note choices. This is basically how we take apart solos in that university improv class, and if this interested you at all, I'd encourage you to find and take apart solos on your own, because it will tell you a lot about the soloist and maybe give you some insight into how to improve your own improvisation, if that's something that you're looking to learn how to do. You can find me on Twitter at 8BitMusicTheory, and if you want to watch me transcribe this very solo, check out the video I put out a little while ago. If you want to support the channel, you can check out my Patreon here. Thanks for watching, and uh, have a good one.